Hello, my name is Mariusz Strzelecki and I'm an LML engineer working in getting data. During this webinar, I'd like to present you the seven ways of how Jupyter can be deployed depending on different requirements and expectations of Jupyter users. The content is based on lessons learned that we gained during deploying Jupyter for our clients, clients of getting data. Uh, as a part of our exploratory data analysis toolkit or as a core part of the MLOps platform. But we, before we go to the main topic, let's do a short intro to Jupyter itself. If you've been working with Python, if you've been analyzing the data in Python, Pandas or PySpark, you are probably familiar with Jupyter already. But for those who don't, uh, Jupyter is the web interface to execute commands on the remote server. Uh, if you work with Jupyter, you create something that is called notebook, and notebook is divided into cells. Cells can store some text descriptions, some markdown code, uh, maybe some formulas and images, uh, but also some cells can be marked as a code cells. And if this is a code cell, then every programming code that you have written uh, in the cell can be executed on the remote server and the results will be pushed back to you. So basically if you are going to explore some data, to build some ML pipelines, to train some ML models, you get the instant response from the server of almost after every line that you have written in your notebook. A few interesting facts. Well, pronunciation of Jupiter. I noticed that some people pronounce Jupiter Jupiter, like in Python. Uh, it looks like the correct pronunciation is Jupiter because I found the presentation of the uh, one of the creators of Jupiter, Fernando Perez, and he pronounced it exactly in this way. Uh, Jupiter was released in 2014 as a spin-off from IPython project. IPython project is something that is actually a better interpreter for Python language when you can execute not only code line after line, but group code in cells and execute them in bulk. Um, Jupyter was created as a spin-off, so it was created as a separate project, and one of the uh, arguments to make this decision was that uh, the creators of Jupyter have seen a capability not only to support Python, as IPython was supposed to do, but maybe to be even language agnostic. And it looks like it was a very smart choice, because right now Jupyter can power not only Python notebooks, but you can use any other interactive language inside. And I will show you a few details about this later. It, in Jupyter saves the notebooks in IPNB format, and this is a huge JSON files uh, that stores the content of the description cells, but also the code of the code cells, and sometimes even the output. So it can store either the inputs, and everybody can re-execute the same notebook, or it can even store the output, so you can uh, provide your notebook with all the outputs, with all the images, charts, and tables to your users. Jupyter can be interactive. There is a library to add widgets, and the widgets you can for example, show a slider, and when user moves the slider to some other position, then it just fires the function to recreate the chart or recreate the table. It allows even more interactivity uh, with the notebook itself. Under the hood, under the hood, you as a user, you work with the browser. So you just open your browser, you open Jupyter URL, and then the mm, user interface is being displayed to you. Uh, the interesting part happens under the under the hood. So your browser communicates with notebook server that is actually Jupyter using standard protocols like HTTP and WebSockets. Also, the notebook file is being stored on the Jupyter server itself. Uh, interesting part is here on the right part of this picture because notebook server, if you decide to start it, if you start, for example, the first cell, it creates and then communicates with something that is called the kernel. And the kernel is just a process running on any system that implements the Jupyter wire protocol and can 
get the commands to be executed from the Jupyter and also provides the uh, outputs using this zero and Q protocol uh, to the notebook server itself. Also with some other functions implemented like auto-completion for example. Uh, and there is a lot of kernels for Jupyter itself. If you open the official wiki of uh, Jupyter you will see that there is a lot of supported languages like Julia, Haskell, Ruby, JavaScript, TypeScript, um, Erlang, Go, Scala, Perl and more. Basically every language that has some kind of interactivity when you can just run a subset of lines and get the instant input uh, against that uh, instant output is, is, is listed there because Jupyter is actually so popular. Uh, there are a few other tools in the Jupyter uh, itself, like there is Jupyter Hub that brings an additional security layer for the Jupyter, because well, by default Jupyter is just a notebook experience and a file browser and some terminal. Uh, but here with Jupyter Hub you can allow multi-tenancy very quickly, so you can allow different users to have their own um, instances of Jupyter and work separately on one server, for example. There is also Jupyter Lab. Uh, in, in contrast to the plain Jupyter, it provides you also the launcher with some tiles when you can plug different kernels, when you can add your own components. Uh, you can also install some extensions like browsers for your data warehouse. You can add widgets. There is a lot of possibilities to extend Jupyter Lab experience in order to meet the expectations of your uh, of your users, users of the of the Jupyter Lab. There are also other interesting sub-projects. Uh, there is Jupyter Book. So basically you can use Jupyter to write the entire book. And here I have the example. And this is the uh, this is the real book. You can even see this is there is ISBN number of this book. Uh, and this is written by Professor Wojciech Broniowski. And the entire book was written in Jupyter itself. Uh, this provides this kind of interactivity because if there is a code cell somewhere you can run it yourself and you can check the results and even you can modify it, your own copy and check how the modifications uh, would behave so you can write a book the real book that uh, that can be released you know with the isbn number in jupyter uh, itself there is nbconvert, and nbconvert is the way to convert these IPNB files created by Jupyter into other formats like HTML or PDF if you have some report in Jupyter and you want to share it with uh, stakehold stakeholders. Uh, or you can even convert notebook into the Python code if this is Python notebook and execute it in the scheduled way on some, um, uh, on some jobs orchestrator. There is NBGrader. NBGrader is a tool for teachers to create the notebooks that have automatic grading uh, system. So teacher creates a set of assertions and he then users are supposed to write a function that meets these assertions. assertions. So this is something that for, especially for learning programming, it can be very useful to automate uh, some processes. There is also NB Viewer. NB Viewer is a tool to display you the content of the IPNB files in the in the browser. So if you have a huge catalog of different notebooks and you want somebody else to just view it, to just make it um, well readable, uh, you install NB Viewer. You push your notebook somewhere, and then you can basically uh, browse the entire catalog of different experiments and reports. Well, you may ask yourself, is it even possible to install Jupyter, this notebook experience, in seven different ways? Well, it turns out there is no golden standard to, to provide this Jupyter for the organization. Uh, Jupyter itself is a very simple application. It can be installed on the laptop, but in order to deal with some remote data, with some big data, in order to work with Spark ecosystem, it's worth it to have Jupyter being installed somewhere 
in the data center or somewhere in the cloud in order to allow users to quick uh, data exploration and um, in order to integrate the system with all the tools available uh, within the organization. Uh, and before we go to these seven architectures, uh, I will show you how do I compare this. So I collected seven different requirements for Jupyter setup. The requirements that the clients were asking us about and something that was important for our clients and for the future users of this Jupyter. Uh, first, accessibility. Accessibility meaning that um, when service is deployed, it should be available for every person in the organization to access it. Not only to data scientists, not only to the very narrow group, but for everybody that wants to maybe do some exploration, maybe just see the report or maybe play with some uh, data warehouse extension. Collaboration. Well, data scientists, they usually work in the uh, team and they, want, they often collabor collaborate on one project. So there should be a way for Jupyter users to share work between them and to be able to um, for example, edit the same notebook or extend the notebook or maybe even share the notebook as the idea for the, for the next product. Scalability. Uh, this is very important uh, in the world of machine learning because a lot of machine learning applications, libraries, they require some special hardware to run the process on. For example, sometimes if you plug the GPU uh, card into your server, you can get boost in your um, in performance of your exploration. So Jupyter should be should allow users to create these instances with high memory or uh, high CP, high number of CPU cores or even with the defined number of uh, GPU cards attached to not block users from doing their ML experiments. Also flexibility, because the standard Jupyter setup may be not enough for every organization. Sometimes you need some special considerations in order to security, in order to who should see what tables in the data warehouse, and uh, flexibility, ability to install the plugins, ability to install the new kernels, is something that is also in the area of interest of our clients. Then security, uh, well, the default Jupyter setup is unsecure so basically you deploy the service and everybody can access it and this um, security aspect so providing uh, multi-tenancy for Jupyter but also auditing uh, is very important checking who fired what query on data warehouse and from what notebook then data availability and this is important factor if you are using some data warehouses and if you are exploring data with Jupyter. Uh, basically, um, Jupyter, well, if Jupyter is the main tool used to do a data exploration, it should be very easy in Jupyter itself to browse the data, to check the data, to load the data using Spark or load to Pandas. So sometimes you need to uh, authenticate to some external, uh, external ecosystems. Sometimes this authentication can be provided to you. So we will check how different Jupyter architectures uh, makes it easier or harder to uh, load the data. Also cost effectiveness. This is a very important factor because of how Jupyter works. Um, Jupyter has this fluctuating resources usage. And what do I mean by this? Well, if user starts a new notebooks, notebook, this notebook uses some memory and uses 0% of CPU. Then user writes some code and executes this cell. And suddenly all the available CPU is in use in order to provide the uh, quick response to the cell. Then the response is being, it travels, travels back to the browser. And users analy user analyzes the response, maybe user writes a new cell, but CPU is unused at the moment. So when you see the CPU and memory usage on the Jupyter servers, they, there, there is a lot of CPU spikes when the cells are being executed, but most of the time the CPU is idle, unless some heavy workload is running in Jupyter, like hyperparameter tuning for ML. 
Uh, also for memory, well, for memory, the more you do in your Jupyter, the more memory do you use. But sometimes you, uh, sometimes you may forget to close the unused kernel of Jupyter, for example, and it will keep some memory occupied even if the the, the notebook is no longer in use. So this cost effectiveness should allow users to deploy uh, notebooks and to use maximum available resources, but also not make it cost ineffective and reduce idleness of the Jupyter setup. Knowing the seven requirements, let's check how these seven different architectures will support these requirements. And there will be grades. So within every architecture, you will see all these seven points listed in different colors. If I marked some something in green it means that I think that this setup nicely responds to this uh, requirement nicely provides uh, capability of, of this given requirement if there will be something in red it means that I think that this capability is not supported at all uh, and maybe if this is something important for your setup you should uh, be aware that it may be really hard and even impossible to support it but if i marked something with yellow it's something like between you know green and red it's something that is supported but there is a way to support it even in the better way so knowing this seven requirements accessibility collaboration scalability being flexible security data availability and cost effectiveness let's move to the seven architectures Architecture number one, one big Jupyter VM uh, that is widely deployed in startups. When you are in startup, when you have not many data scientists working in a system, you are aiming to uh, minimize the efforts and to provide the tools necessary uh, for your employees, for your teams. Um, in order to support this, uh, the, we can, you can just use the easiest setup possible. You can just create one virtual machine, either in data center or in cloud, set up Jupyter there, and just share the Jupyter URL with the users. Every user will be able to log in there to uh, open the new notebook or open the existing notebook and to execute the cells. It's trivial to set up. Uh, because you just need to create a VM and populate with some uh, populate it with some service, probably also mount the some persistent volume with the notebooks in order to not lose the notebooks if the server is restarted. It's a very good use case if the entire data warehouse is readable by all the users because you don't have actually any security layer here. So data warehouse. Uh, is available for every user uh, of this Jupyter setup in the same way, with the same set of access rights. Uh, people should trust each other, because if they work on the same file system, storing the notebooks in the same directory, uh, they should trust each other not to overwrite the data, not to make unnecessary copies, not to look into the notebooks that they are not supposed to look into, and so on. Also, you cannot get any accountability um, property here. So basically you cannot see who executed what notebook, when and why, uh, because all the notebooks are just running uh, using the one um, uh, system user and basically uh, you can only ask your users. But still, if um, if you are if you are working with the very uh, basic setup and you have like two or three people working on Jupyter only, this may be a very good uh, solution for you. Let's see the grades. Well, accessibility it's on green because, well, if Jupyter is just a public service, then you just need to share this URL of the service with your users and they access it and everybody can access it. Collaboration, it's on green because if users reuse the same instance of Jupyter, uh, they can even share the uh, link to notebooks between them and everybody will see the same uh, the same view scalability it's on red uh, why it's on red well first when you create this vm for the very first time you will 
propagate some some resources to this VM. Uh, suddenly, if some user wants to experiment with ML model that requires high memory usage, well, the only way to support it uh, is to recreate this virtual machine with uh, bigger requirements. Or if somebody needs the GPU, you need to recreate with plugging plug the GPU. So every time you want to allow users to do something for their something not not specific, not standard, you need to scale the VM and then maybe just maybe scale it down when the experiment is over. That's why scalability is very manual. It's and it's basically not scalable server. If you are running in the cloud, you can maybe do this uh, quite quickly, but it's always some kind of maintenance break for your users. Flexibility. It's on yellow because you can adjust Jupyter to your requirements, but every user keeps uh, will have exactly the same uh, Jupyter experience. Uh, so if one user requires some special system library with some special version for their um, for their experiments, and if some other users need some li the same library but with the other version, this. Uh, this setup will not support it because you are running on one operating system. Security is on, on red and this is well the obvious grade uh, because uh, here we do not have any security or accountability on our system. Data availability, availability it's on green because the data are, can be actually made really uh, nicely available. If you are running um, the data warehouse based on uh, Hadoop and maybe based on Kerberos you can just authenticate the entire server to read all the data. If you are re running data warehouse in BigQuery you can create a service account that will have full access to this BigQuery dataset and users do not need to care about authenticating to the data warehouse. Cost effect effectiveness it's on yellow and it's on, on yellow because the system is kind of cost effective meaning that, well, users share the same CPU, share the same memory, so they reuse as many resources as, as available. Uh, but in this setup, we often landed with the problem of um, forgotten kernels. So users do something uh, in their notebook, or they do some experiments, they, for example, uh, reserve a big chunks of memory for their setup and then they close the browser and they never go back to this because they already know the results. In this case this kernel is um, uh, still running there occupying some memory and maybe some other users will see okay maybe we need to scale VM up because there is no free memory and actually there could be. So this cost effectiveness it's on yellow because the system is not super cost effective uh, but it shares some resources so that's a, that's a good thing the computational resources. The second setup is based on creating Jupyter Hub with local VM spawner. How does it work? Well, you still have one big virtual machine, but instead of providing just Jupyter experience, you install Jupyter Hub. And Jupyter Hub will provide the login form for users to authenticate to the system. And after authentication, user can create their own uh, Jupyter uh, container in, some, in the server and user will keep um, uh, his or her own notebooks within this uh, container. This is actually the easiest way to achieve secure system. It's very similar to the previous case, but you just install one additional server and you provide Jupyter as a container and suddenly your system is kind of secure. Uh, let's see the grades. Uh, accessibility is still on green. Uh, it's still on green because every user can go through this Jupyter uh, hub login form. If you are using uh, some uh, LDAP authentication in your, in your organization or maybe O2 or OpenID Connect system, you can allow every user to just log in there and to open the new Jupyter. Collaboration is on green. Uh, there is a, a common idea to create a shared volume between the containers. So if one user want to, wants to um, share the notebook with some other user, uh, then this user just copies these notebooks into the shared folder and now every user can see it and can browse it and copy it maybe to their own workbench. 
Scalability, it's on red because of the reasons like in the previous image. If somebody, in the previous architecture, if somebody needs more resources, then you can only scale this VM. There is nothing that will plug automatically the needed resources and will unplug them when they are not needed anymore. Flexibility, it's on green, is if you use Jupyter in container, then every person can have its own version of container, and with containers, you are super flexible to provide uh, per user uh, um, experience for different uh, types of users and for different requirements. Security, it's on green. Jupyter Hub is a very secure system. It allows users to be separate. It allows some accountability as well. So you know who, what user is, is accessing what workbench and when. Uh, data availability, it's on yellow now. Because if you create a new Jupyter instance for every user, uh, then you need to provide some way for users to authenticate to this external ecosystem and this authentication well needs to be kind of permanent uh, because so, so users don't need to re-log in every hour for example to your google cloud so there is one extra step you know when user create the new jupyter server they need to authenticate themselves and this manual step can be sometimes forgotten and you will get some kind of support requests from your users Cost effectiveness, it's still on yellow. Users share the same CPU, they share the same memory, it could be uh, maybe better. Um, architecture number three separate Jupyter virtual machine per team. Uh, this is a variant of the first architecture when, where we had one global VM only, uh, but here we create VMs virtual machines separately per team what does it allow to us well well teams usually share, share the same data access right uh, so you make you can make the, the vms uh, automatically um, authenticated to your data warehouse there is no need for every user to uh, to leave their own um, uh, authentication credentials on every system and they work on common projects so when it comes to collaboration they can just log to the same vm and and, and share the work and this setup is trivial to do with infrastructure as a code so if you use terraform you just create one module for deploying new jupyter instance and then you run basically the same module multiple times uh, resulting in multiple vms being mm, uh, deployed Let's check the grades. Accessibility, uh, it's on yellow because right now we have the Jupyter VM per team. So if some person is not a member of the um, of some data science team, then this user may have some issues accessing every uh, accessing some some Jupyter uh, system, and maybe you need to provide something else like the Jupyter for other clients, something like this. Collaboration is on green because you people usually collaborate within the team and within the team they just share the same uh, workspace and they can collaborate very nicely scalability it's on yellow uh, because it's kind of better than in the previous setups if some team decides to go to the ml way and they are experimenting with tensorflow and they want some gpu uh, instances uh, for their experimentation. You don't need to put to maintenance every single Jupyter uh, kernel, Jupyter workbench in your system. You just need to coordinate it within this single team. And it's always easier to just coordinate it in this way, especially when it comes to upscaling and downscaling that is manual. Flexibility, it's on green because every Jupyter uh, setup can be adjusted to the specific team requirements. Security is on green, you just need to apply this extra layer, so you need to check that, you need to ensure that only users from specific teams can log to their Jupyter VMs. You cannot just allow open access anymore. Data availability, it's on green, because you can provide the uh, automated keyless way to uh, access data warehouse from your Jupyter uh, notebooks based on the team access right 
and cost effectiveness it's on it's on yellow the system is maybe better cost effective the users do not share cpus anymore but uh, you don't need to keep uh, oversized one big oversized virtual machine just in case if some team wants to do some experimentation you can tune them uh, very nicely and you can use smaller uh, vms uh, if they are available and if their teams do not have um, that you know, big requirements of the computational power. Architecture number four, it involves Kubernetes. Uh, and I named it Jupyter on Kubernetes, the quick kubeflow case. Uh, what do I mean by quick? Uh, when you install kubeflow um, platform that provides you, uh, among others, it provides you the kubeflow notebook system to create the notebook servers. Uh, then every notebook uh, is just a separate container running somewhere in, in, in Kubernetes, every notebook server. Uh, and some people used to say that, well, Kubernetes is the best way to share resources between the, the different processes, uh, so maybe it should be actually a very cost-effective uh, solution, running this in Kubeflow. Uh, but unfortunately, if the teams, if the users of Jupyter have no knowledge of Kubernetes, of how the resource management in Kubernetes works, it may lead to some issues like a huge underutilization of the resources. Uh, when you create a new notebook, uh, then the Kubeflow interface will ask you, well, how much memory do you need for your notebooks? What uh, for your notebook? What are the limits? What are the requests you want to add? And data scientists and data analysts that want to explore the data, they usually do not know. Uh, they just require enough memory for, for their, their idea not to starve for memory, but they don't know exactly in megabytes or in gigabytes how much memory do they need, so they usually claim the bigger memory, the bigger, you know, the, the, the larger memory amount. And this causes uh, to this imitation of, of cost effectiveness. So, setup on Kubernetes seems cost-effective because you know there can be multiple Jupiters running on the same on the same node. But usually, if users provide the, the very huge request of resources, it's not the case. On the right, you see the um, the wizard uh, the wizard page uh, that is used to create a new notebook server. And then you can see that you need to specify the total amount of CPU and RAM reserved by your notebook server. And users usually put the biggest, bigger numbers there because they want the data to be calculated quickly and with no memory issues. And it leads to huge reservations that are unused most of the time on the Kubernetes. Let's see the grades. Accessibility, it's on green because with Kubeflow, with this uh, DEX, uh, authentication that is installed by default, you have a lot of ways to make it accessible for, for everybody. Collaboration is on red now, because every user um, uh, runs in their own namespace in Kubeflow. There is a way to share namespace of one user with some other user, but unfortunately it shares not only the notebooks, but also the all the files or the all the passwords that are stored there, all the credentials and so on. So it may be sometimes not an option to just collaborate in this way. Scalability is on green because Kubeflow is super scalable, uh, especially if you install it on Kubernetes that is backed by the cloud system like EKS in AWS or GKE in cloud. Uh, if you need some special uh, notebook, then autoscaler of such cluster can uh, plug a node from borrowed from this cloud provider that is big enough to uh, run basically any container uh, that you need. So scalability, it's basically the system is super scalable in this uh, in this public cloud platforms. Flexibility. It's on green because here we run in containers and every container can be specialized for different team or for different users. 
uh, security it's on green uh, because of kubeflow that provides very uh, secure layer very uh, tight security security uh, considerations for uh, all the users with this separated workspaces and uh, and namespaces data availability it's on yellow uh, this is similar case to jupyter hub here users when they open the uh, new Jupyter node, Jupyter server in Kubeflow, they need to authenticate to the, the, the data warehouse in order to link their Jupyter server with some remote data warehouse. And this can be sometimes problematic, especially if they want to share notebooks between them. Cost effectiveness, it's on yellow. Uh, sorry, it's on red because of the uh, issues that I mentioned to you uh, before. So basically, cost effectiveness uh, it's there is only a imitation of this cost effectiveness if users create notebooks that are, have two huge reservations then the resources are wasted because a lot of uh, kubernetes nodes is running in your kubernetes cluster and they are doing nothing just before because of this reservations running in the system architecture number five manage notebooks like VMs. And this will be case of Google service that is called AI Notebooks or Vertex Platform User Managed Notebooks. In this case, uh, you don't provide any infrastructure for running your Jupyter. You just allow users to open the Google console, the user interface, and the users will see their wizard of you know, creating a new Jupyter uh, VM. Uh, unfortunately, if users need some special extensions installed, some special kernels or some other special things, uh, then you need to provide a Docker image that will support it and uh, unfortunately adjusting this managed service for the user's requirements, if they have some specific ones, it's a nightmare. You need to chase the Google uh, the releases from, from Google of the new services and base the new image based on their image. Or you can build an image from the scratch, uh, but it's really hard to make it uh, compatible with uh, this AI notebooks. But the maintenance costs are minimal, and I hope you can feel it, uh, because there is no VM, there is no Terraform, there is no Kubernetes cluster. Users just user user just go to the to the, the interface and they create something, and Google takes care of creating all the required resources uh for them let's see the grades accessibility it's on um, the yellow because you need to provide all your users within the organization to access google console it may be not the case uh, always but even if they have access to google console they need very wide set of permissions because these notebooks are started as a mm, virtual machines so every user uh, needs to have capability to run and uh, suspend and delete even a virtual machine. And these are actually very broad permissions. Uh, if you are using, using uh, Google VMs for something else, like running some microservices or, or, some, or some clusters, then it may be not an option to provide this wide permission set for every data scientist. Collaboration is on green uh, because you can create the uh, services per team. Uh, scalability it's on green because we are running in public cloud so scalability is, is natural uh, flexibility it's on yellow because of this difficulties with providing the managed um, uh, well adjusting the managed service docker image to your requirements security is uh, achieved by just you know using the google console data availability it can be created in the passwordless way if you provide a notebook per team it's very easy to do so and cost effectiveness here unfortunately it's on red in my opinion uh, because this is very similar case uh, to like the uh, kubeflow case users create the notebooks they usually claim more resources that they actually need and then if they forgot to uh, close the notebook for some reason or for the weekend or if they have some you know high memory machine with for gpus plugged in and they forgot to close it for the weekend then uh, the monday will welcome you with the huge bill from your 
uh, Google uh, from your cloud provider like Google. So the system is not really cost effective, and you need to at least monitor the usage of the <coughs> of the resources occupied by the cluster and the Google Cloud objects that are created by this service. Infrastructure number six: Kubeflow notebooks, not by the book setup. This is something that we have we deployed in our, one of our client system, and we are actually happy with this because the notebooks are not something that is used for heavy memory computation or heavy CPU computation, but they are just user interfaces for Spark applications with dynamic allocation. So if users need to just write some reports, to just run some SQL query on BigQuery, for example, when you don't need some CPUs because BigQuery does the calculation for you and just returns the results, uh, then you just create a very small notebook machine. If you want to do some heavy uh, calculation, you also run this small notebook machine because Spark is utilized here. And Spark with dynamic allocation and with cluster auto-scaling, it allows to borrow, borrow the resources from the uh, public cloud provider when they are needed for the calculation. And then the uh, unused executors are being dropped and the nodes are unplugged and you do no longer pay for it. Also, the idea here that is that notebook servers are created per team and it allows this keyless authentication, but also personal notebooks are available for private experiments. <clears throat> Let's see the grades. Accessibility provided by Kubeflow on green, collaboration, if no teams work on the common projects in this team-wide notebooks, then it's on green. Uh, scalability. Uh, again on green, especially if running in public cloud. Uh, flexibility, because here we run Jupyter uh, in containers. This is uh, uh, this is uh, th these containers are uh, adjustable for every user requirement. Um, security, it's on it's on green because of Kubeflow, because of this audit audit logs available. Uh, data availability, it can be done in the keyless way, if especially in the namespaces that are uh, wide, uh, team-wide. So if entire team uses one namespace and if the team uses the same set of rights to access the data warehouse, then we can just make it passwordless. Uh, and cost-effectiveness, it's kind of yellow one. It's kind of yellow because we limited the waste of resources to the absolute minimum. But still, if users tend to use their personal notebooks for private experiments a lot, you will end up with a lot of pods and maybe you need to care, take care of um, uh, suspending notebooks that are not in use in order to free these uh, resources. And then architecture number seven, the last one, cloud managed notebooks. And this uses the cloud uh, service again, but not the same like before. Before we discussed the Google AI notebooks case when every notebook was the virtual machine, uh, but uh, it looks like Google Cloud offers a new service that can be uh, ideal for our case. This is called the Notebooks API, and these are notebooks managed by Google. So when user starts the notebook, no VM is created in your VPC. Basically, some container is created in some Google VPC, and user just sees the link to this container and user is authenticated to the no notebook. This is still in experimental phase and only four regions are available, but it seems like a very good case for running this ad hoc analysis or quick ML experiments. There are no maintenance costs uh, and the bill is clean because it shows you exactly uh, what notebook used, uh, how much resources, uh, at uh, what time. Uh, the notebook can, executions can be easily scheduled because if you have your notebook in some container running in some Google ecosystem, then if you need this to be scheduled, then Google will, will start the notebook, execute it and shut it down uh, easily. And also if you need some Spark experience, you can run remote kernels on Dataproc. And Dataproc is the uh, managed Hadoop uh, from Google. So you can use the same if you need a distributed processing. It is not available by default on these containers, but you can run the remote kernel. And the grades. 
accessibility it's on uh, green because right now you just need to ensure that your users have your your colleagues the teams that you are providing jupyter for that they have access to google uh, console to google ui and right away they can just start experimenting with the system there is no need to provide very wide permissions like permission to create the virtual machine collaboration it's unfortunately on yellow because uh, these days at least as far as i know there is no way for multiple users to uh, to reuse the same notebook server so these are like private servers scalability it's on green we are in the cloud flexibility is on yellow because if you need to adjust this managed service for your specific requirement this is a similar case like for ai notebooks from google there is a lot of a tuning a lot of considerations uh, on how to install like some special extension inside security it's on green uh, because google covers it data availability it's also in green using service accounts in google and cost effectiveness i think here we can add a green mark and this is because these notebooks these containers this this you know uh, process is running somewhere in the Google Cloud uh, are being terminated after some time of idleness. So when you create your notebook, by default, after three hours of not using the, uh, the service, the container will be suspended, not dropping the data, but only dropping the CPU and memory. And you can resume it very quickly uh, with just the requirement to redo uh, rerun the cells that you executed before so this three hours it makes it really easy to make the system cost effective to not leave the notebooks that are not in use in the system uh, and not to uh, have too much much memory unoccupied for things that are no longer in use summary well we check different architectures of providing Jupyter experience. Jupyter on VMs, Jupyter on Kubernetes, and Jupyter in public cloud. And after this presentation, I hope you have no doubt that one does not simply install Jupyter. There is no one golden standard of Jupyter should be deployed like this or like this. There is a lot of ways. The service itself is very flexible and can integrate with a lot of solutions. And every time considering the Jupyter setup in your organization, you should take into consideration all these uh, requirements that different setup support that different setups support or not or support but maybe not ideally. Cloud offering seems promising uh, because with the especially with this fluctuating resource utilization, cloud offering can help a lot in order to, borrow the resources, the computational resources when they are needed and then give them back to the other, to the, to the cloud, to the pool when they are not needed, especially with this uh, auto-termination of idle kernels. And Jupyter on Kubernetes, it makes sense to use it, but only with users trained to understand Kubernetes. If you just install Kubeflow or any other Jupyter on Kubernetes uh, flavor and you just allow users to create any container of any size and just keep it uh, as long as they need it, then you will end up with a lot of underutilized resources and then this can be super cost inefficient uh, setup. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. In case of any questions, there will be some contact information in the description of the video. For now, I just wish you a great day. Bye.